Welcome to everyone who's here. Uh, my name is Emily Markert. I'm a second year student at CCA in the Curatorial Practice Graduate Program. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting this event today with Catherine Clark Gallery and artist Jen Bourbon as part of our spring event series called On View, which really is designed to connect CCA graduate students with Bay Area galleries and the local arts community while our school remains largely remote. Um, and so today we have the pleasure of receiving a virtual tour of Jen Bourbon Doing and Undoing, which just opened last weekend at Catherine Clark Gallery. And the gallery is located just a few blocks away from CCA's San Francisco campus and the CCA Wattis Institute. So I hope you can all make it there if and when you're back in the Bay Area. Um, the exhibition is up until May 29th. So you have some time if you will be in the area. Um, I'm going to drop the link to the exhibition into the chat. So oop, you all have it. Um, and so for a little background about the gallery, uh, established in 1991, Catherine Clark Gallery exhibits contemporary art in all disciplines. The gallery's physical space includes a main gallery and a dedicated media room in which video and time-based art is shown in response to or in tandem with each exhibition. And Catherine Clark serves as the primary dealer for an acclaimed roster of international artists who frequently exhibit with important venues and biennials around the world. And today we are joined by owner and founding director Catherine Clark, who's not only the founder of the gallery, but also an accomplished writer and editor and a native San Franciscan who plays a key role in the city's art scene. Uh, and then with us in the gallery, uh, acting as our sort of virtual tour guide is Anton Stubner, who's the gallery director and also an alum of CCA's visual and critical studies program. So I wanna shout that out. Um, and then finally, I will stop talking in a moment, but I also wanna introduce Jen Bourbon, um, who's with us to tour us through this exhibition of her work. Uh, Jen is a poet and visual artist whose interdisciplinary range of projects and long-term research tends to relationships between text and textiles, the presence and absence of the work of women artists and writers, abstractions of language and landscape, and concepts of repair. Jen's work results from collaboration with artists and specialists ranging from literary scholars to material scientists to activate the intersections of art and science, technology, and craft in works that range from poems written at nanoscale to large-scale museum installations. Her work has been exhibited at and appears in the collections of major museums around the globe, and she's been featured in arts publications such as Art Forum and Freeze. Additionally, Jen has authored 11 books and artist books, and she's also received a number of major grants, awards, and fellowships for her art as well as her publications, too many for me to list off here. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jen and the gallery team for our virtual walkthrough, and then we'll switch from the walkthrough to a sort of closer look at some of the works on screen since they're very detailed. Uh, and along the way, I will pose some questions to Jen about her work and practice, but we also welcome your questions, whether you want to use the chat or just unmute yourself, um, especially towards the end of the program. So thank you all for being here and I'm going to turn it over now. Thanks, Emily. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you and thanks so much for the opportunity to share this exhibition with you. Um, at a distance and hopefully in person at the gallery soon. Um, I'm gonna to read to keep this part really crisp and I think Anton is going to share his screen. So maybe I'll turn my video off so that I, you can hear me but not see me. Okay, all right. I can spotlight him too, Jen, if you wanna keep your okay. video on. Don't worry, I can fix that. Okay, there we go, I'm back on. Hi, Anton. Okay, so thanks so much for uh, this invitation to welcome you to my first solo exhibition with Catherine Clark Gallery, Doing and Undoing. It's on view through May 29th. In the office and back gallery, you can also experience a selection of stellar works by three artists I admire very much, Stephanie Suyuko, Mary Watt, and Linka Clayton, who's also, I understand, in the CCA show coming up. Uh, the gallery is free and open for walk-in and in-person visits and offers a range of ways to experience the work online as well. 
Throughout the exhibition, I invite viewers to imagine the possibilities and responsibilities embedded in poetic forms of doing and undoing, knowing and unknowing, and to reflect on language as a material and technology for deeper forms of connection. Encompassing sewn works, installation, artist books, and video, more than 20 new pieces draw on the poetic tensions of text and textile. Experiencing sewn works, installation, artist books, and video. Oh, sorry, I glitched. Uh, experiencing these works in an embodied close way is particularly meaningful. So I hope you can come see the gallery in person, bring your friends, family, and return often. Okay, so now we'll go into the media room. Um, this is a new piece. Uh, the exhibition title is based on. It stems from a new video cycle that draws from an expression that my wife's Francophone family uses often, faire et défaire c'est travailler, which could be translated as doing and undoing its working or doing and undoing its work. The expression evokes domestic activities and cycles intimately familiar during the pandemic as we collectively reconnect with our immediate surroundings at home. Through these metaphors of doing and undoing, the video also raises larger questions about cycles of living and dying and our relationship to the social fabric and the critical ongoing work of anti-racist learning and unlearning, doing and undoing necessary to create a more equitable world. Reflecting on the intergenerational transmission of this expression, this video depicts the hands of three family members writing and unwriting, erasing and rewriting this endlessly applicable expression, spanning small hands new to lettering to aging hands for whom writing is becoming increasingly difficult. So we'll just watch for a second. So depending on where you catch this video, uh, you'll see the writing being, you know, uh, the, the film will be reversed and the, the writing will be coming back, um, back up off the page. So it also uh, corresponds to an embroidery out in the galleries. Let's see if we can get an image of it. Um, and it focuses on each of the three handwritten drafts in the video embroidered on household cloth previously set aside for mending. So there you have the youngest embroiderer. Thanks Anton, that looks really good. And one thing I love about the um, the oldest writer is that uh, hers is the fastest. It's like a 20 second clip, whereas, you know, the youngest is uh, something like seven minutes, I think, um, to write. So there's a real difference in pacing in that piece. Uh, so the main galleries feature new work um, called Close Reading. It's a constellation of new works that poetically respond to sheltering in place during a time of human loss on an unprecedented scale. The series title Close Reading comes from two poets, Erica Hunt, who describes love as close reading. 
that, quote, helps me invent myself more in the future. And Claudia Rankine, who writes, it's the most workable definition I found to date. At their core, these works hold love, companionship, grieving, and repair close. While the various titles were still in flux, the gallery director Anton helped situate this title and the title of the show into the right place. So it's been uh, collaborative all along. Uh, I should say that a lot of the works in this show are, um, they're all fragments from Dickinson and they aren't necessarily a um, constellated group. They're um, together in the show, but they, in, within the body of Dickinson's work, they point out um, to very different vectors and reading directions. So I think of it as a great place to start reading. Um, I'm drawn to poetry's relationship to indeterminacy, porousness, instability, or open-endedness. In close reading, I've reimagined the American poet Emily Dickinson's late fragments and manuscript drafts in magnified textile forms that draw upon the formal characteristics of their source materials and manuscript facsimiles, realized as standalone works or as mirrored diptychs that represent the front and back of a page. These tactile meditative works are threshold texts that draw on the particulars of Dickinson's language and script in order to offer the space for careful sustained attention and for close looking, close reading, to contemplate how poets touch poems and by extension readers in the space of a poem. Dickinson's penciled writings are sewn in facsimile into hand dyed cotton batting with silver metallic thread, a slow cumulative process that recreates the velocity and brilliance of Dickinson's ephemeral compositions scaled up uh, times six. By foregrounding the cotton batting, I question the provenance of the 19th century paper ground and its relationship to suffering. I would have, it would have been common knowledge in a New England household that paper was made from linen and cotton cloth rags. This was the case until the end of the Civil War when the paper industry shifted from wood pulp, though paper currency is still made out of cotton rag. Reading cotton paper in relationship to the global empire of cotton is essential. It's been engineered through white colonial violence in the form of indigenous land expropriation, the horrors of enslavement, the shift to monoculture farming, all privileged and violently protected by a carefully constructed political machine. Add to that the widespread labor exploitation in the paper mills and every aspect of this material, human and ecological, points to what is literally explicitly a ground of suffering. So how do we read texts written on them honestly, closely? Between 1858 and 1864, Dickinson grouped her handwritten poems composed on stationary folios into 40 packets, later called fascicles, stab bound with red and white twist thread. In the fascicles, Dickinson's first experiments with the variants, the plus signs that direct readers to other possible words or phrases in her poetry manuscripts. Due to editorial in interventions, this innovative system is consistently removed in print versions of her work. These works offer a composite view of the removed variant marks in her fascicle groupings of about 16 to 22 poems per packet. This one is an image of fascicle 38.
Okay. Now switch over to my screen. Okay. Great. So the in exhibition, and can you all see the, is the quilt up? Okay. Yes, it looks great. All right, thanks. Um, the exhibition includes one work from the Dickinson Composite Quilt Series, a related artist book project with Granary Books and selected, uh, oops. There we go. Um, and selected books, including The Gorgeous Nothings, Emily Dickinson's Envelope Poems and Mar with Marta Wartner and Susan Howe. When I first made the Dickinson composite quilts, I was intuitively approximating the feeling of a magnified page with the cotton batting, also the inner layer of a quilt. I wanted to make the series span how the variant marks transform and shift in frequency and scale over the course of the 40 fascicle sets and set, sets. In a conversation we will publish in my survey catalog later this year, Claudia Rankin writes of the series. The variant marks are raised up in the composites with red crosses and dashes on blue lines stitched on white cotton quilts. The blue lines represent the lines on notebook paper. The red marks honor the deliberate notations that came from Dickinson's own hands. So this is still Claudia speaking. Though this is fantasy, I've always considered your intervention, your men's of omission, as a way to bandage the omissions of a poet who wrote during the Civil War but whose work never mentioned the enslaved people who remain at the center of that storm. Unlike Walt Whitman, who in his way struggles with the reality of the times, Dickinson's lack of expressed thoughts on slavery remains a mystery, albeit a typical white one. The composites are held historically within the time frame of that particular version of white violence and the cotton material with stitched dashes and red crosses or plus signs read to me as visual elegy for no good reason other than that the fact that like you, I wish to put back what was overlooked even by Dickinson herself before the interventions began. But this thought, which probably came about for me because your composites are on cotton, the material originally harvested by the enslaved is an insertion which functions as critical fabulation to use Sadia Hartman's terminology, but hey, end quote. To be a white American in the 19th century or today is horrific, a horror seemingly without end. Or as James Baldwin put it so succinctly, I would not want to be a white American for all the tea in China, all the oil in Texas. I really wouldn't like to have to live with all those lies. That's on Dickinson and that's on me. In Looking for Lorraine by Amani Perry, Hansberry refers to America as beautiful and horrific. I'm trying to hold that, to touch those two truths together and keep at it, doing and undoing, learning and unlearning. Dickinson's body of work in manu manuscript form is massive. In close readings of her manuscripts, my attention delves into various modes of research and reading, struck by lines of a poem, pulling at the thread of a particular question, studying a constellation of, a variant, of variant relationships, a visual idiosyncrasy, the graphic feel of a page. I take in the valence of the whole. In remaking it in textile form, I get proximate and touch it all. Just wanted to point out here how the variants are working. Um, so the, um, the line, I'll read a little bit from this, this manuscript who vital only to our thoughts such presence bear away in dying tis as if our souls absconded suddenly. The word souls is a variant, it has that cross in front of it. And um, to find how it correlates, you look to the end of the poem or the sides of the poem and start reading backwards up into the poem. So the words, for, the variant for the word souls is world, selves and sun. Um, which does a lot in the space of the poem, but once you start reading that um, in relation to other poems where those words occur, 
it starts um, kind of, uh, there's like a sense of fermentation um, in how you can start to read and think about her um, language groupings. Um, and it's a, it, it is sort of what I'd call the variant system is prevalent throughout her work. Even the um, late fragments continue to use it. You can see there's, this is the um, backside of a manuscript where there are variants all the way but down. And so I've been interested in creating transcriptions and translations of those spaces, um, trying to preserve as much of um, what she did as she did it um, for readers to take in. Um, and I think I mentioned it earlier, but this work really hasn't um, been widely available to the public. Um, and part of, part of my work as an artist and a writer has been trying to extend that visibility um, of the sort of the visual production side of her work as well. So I've been engaging with Dickinson's work since 2004 and it's been in parallel with other works um, entangled in writings with Ruth Asawa, Annie Albers, uh, and the fourth century poet Su Wei. My work em uh, emerges in conversation with other artists and writers, but also in collaboration with artists, material scientists, scholars, and archives. The work in the show is created with a constellated studio team of eight sewers and one printer, uh, fellow artists, writers, musicians, and conservators. So it's not just me making these works, it's a pretty big team and we were spread out. Um, across the country. So Texas, um, Brooklyn, Houston, Brooklyn, Providence, Guilford, where I live. Um, and yeah, Brooklyn again, so, uh, and New Haven. So um, I'll read a little bit from the works, but I just wanted to say that the show was uh, the first time for a lot of people where they got to go experience works in person um, after being vaccinated. And uh, one really special interaction at the opening was uh, with our friend Vivian Hillgrove, who is um, at this point, very low vision, um, very uh, not entirely blind. She can still see peripherally. Um, but she was able to experience the work in a really uh, like incredibly proximate way. And it was almost, uh, you know, so I was able to read the, read the works while she was touching them and experiencing them up close. And um, it reminded me a little bit of the one-to-one -one audio description that Melissa Johnson did of the survey show. Um, and, and it's, I think it's really, um, the audio description in particular is a really special way of getting at the work in a more intimate uh, form. Sometimes the Zoom talks can be kind of generalized and the audio description is like right there. Um, so it's a form that I'm excited about and um, want to keep using. And uh, I've been thinking about like, um, Fan DV's touch tours that she did with um, Georgina Cleage at Caddis. And uh, so I was really excited that just happened kind of organically at the opening with Vivian. A lot of the works are printed on the backs of other uh, paper media. So this one was on a, some sort of an advertising flyer and the text um, handwritten by Dickinson says, the, the blood is more showy than the breath but cannot dance as well. And uh, this fragment came to mind. I've been you know, reading Dickinson for so long but this one came to mind um, when a, a really a close friend of ours, a poet uh, French poet Franck André Jean passed because we had been working in conversation on some of these late fragments and this was always his favorite so it, it came back to me um, thinking of him. Here's the manuscript it's based on. Uh, 
And I wanted to show you this one because it's in progress in the studio right now. Uh, it's, it's big, it's like as big as the sloth embroidery and it's printed on the back of a linens, uh, linen advertisement. Um, but it has, uh, it has that sort of ghosting even on the reverse. So you really get that sense of front and back visually from, from the work. Um, I don't know if it's uh, necessary to know, but uh, I think that I, I figured out that this piece would be 150 hours to sew, which is how I knew it wouldn't be ready for the show. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to keep going on it. Uh, installing the works was really fun. Um, Katie. <laughs> It had a, like a total vision and plan. Like it was it, like light, a lightning bolt. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it at all, Katie? Because you had such a clear sense of how you wanted things to go. Well, some of that has to do with the familiarity of the space and kind of understanding how people um, engage with work. And, um, and so then how I want a show to unfold across um, an exhibit which might be very different from say how it would be um, curated into a book, for example. Um, but also, you know, bringing out some of the humor maybe to like the sloth piece, I don't know, um, yeah, well, you guys have seen it already, but it's not in the gallery, that, the part of the gallery that's up on the screen now, but the um, front part of my gallery, um, Sorry, Anton, am I making you run all over the place? That's right. <laughs> um, so the sloth piece is the one on the left there, and it's one of the larger works in the show. And there's all this space around this one word, a word that's sort of funny and I think also ironic in the context of the exhibit, one that was incredibly laborious for Jen to craft. Um, and then opposite on a small wall is the tiniest piece in the show. Um, I don't know if I have that I'm one. Pulling it up there now. Um, and the words on that say, grasped, grasped by God. Yeah. And I, like, I love the conversation between those two pieces, this thing that's infinite, perhaps, or unknowable, huge God on the tiniest piece in the show. Um, on also a small wall in the show. Um, so there are things like that, but um, you know, I, I also liked working with you in terms of understanding for you what was going on with the work. And I felt like that conversation just happened really organically as we were placing pieces. And um, I don't know, for me, it's the most creative part of what I do, right? Is, um, some, sometimes artists will say they see their work really differently um, when it's represented to them in the context of a gallery or when we exert some kind of curatorial um, uh, uh, idea on how the work um, makes itself visible to, to the public that comes um, in to see it. And there's a funny thing, I mean, for those of you who are students um, trying to understand um, and learn about how an exhibition gets mounted. I think one of the things that's really interesting is um, to understand how bodies interact with other bodies in a space. And there's something that happens in, in the world of galleries that um, a lot of people who work in galleries notice, which is when people enter the space, they often don't want to engage initially with whoever is behind the front desk. So there's a turning of the body immediately in my space because of where the desk is and where the doors are into the first gallery, like you go right immediately. So knowing that then there's just a way that a show unfolds across the space based on how people physically, most people generally feel physically um, when they enter the space. So those considerations might be really different say from what maybe the order in which Jen made these works or even like, I don't know where in the archives say one of these texts might um, 
exist and relate to another. Um, also, this may sound strange, but um, in addition to a background in art history, I have a background in dance. And I feel like there's something for me that's very um, kinesthetic or physical about um, making choices about how work lives in a space. And I have a really difficult time curating a show in advance. Like uh, some artists come with an idea, a very fixed idea about how the work is going to behave in the space. And I'm always really nervous about that because it, it never quite works that way. Um, and um, I've often found that the most successful hangs, if you will, um, are when it sort of happened the way that we did at Jen, where like we, we just sort of jumped in and I don't know that either of us had a specific idea, but it just kind of emerged. Um, it was, I felt like it was really fun and it just, it, the work told us where it wanted to be. I know that sounds really new agey, but it did. So, and, and, you know, we made a couple little shifts and I, I'm really happy with it. There were other things too to consider for me anyway, which was um, just the, some of the formal elements, like um, not having all the pieces of one color in one room um, kind of presenting a diversity of um, sizes and um, colors. Um, and, you know, so those formal concerns, um, because before anybody knows what work is about, they're um, experiencing it just in terms of its visual language. So how that, you know, affects us um, has, has to be part of the consideration, I think. Um, are there things you would change, Jen, if, if, if you hung it again? No, I love what you did. And I, it was so much fun. Um, you know, I literally, I gave such uh, intense focus to the making of the work and um, all of the things around creating it and packing it and shipping it, which was super fun because it's textile, it's light, it mounts with Velcro. It's like, it's a good system to work out and it's um, very agile and, um, relatively easy as an install goes. And working with Javier in the gallery was so yeah. nice. Uh, we were trading a lot of tricks, like he puts a magnet on his hammer. So when you drop pins, it's, they're easy to pick up on the ground, you know, like just these <laughs> little, you know, small details, but, um, or like, you know, when I push pins into the wall, I use a, like a money counting finger, those rubber fingers. And I use them for sewing too, when I, you have to really pull and it saves your, hands a lot of sort of, you know, carpal tunnel stress. Um, so there's, there's sort of these like um, little things that you take take a, along. Um, but I remember Katie, I turned to you and I was like, I have all the works, I have no idea how they should. <laughs> I'm hoping you have ideas. And, you know, you really had the layout within the first, the first go, it was, it was really fun. I am um, um, back to Javier for a second. I um... I, I also think it's really important to keep space for how accidents can become um, uh, mm. like a smarter uh, solution. Um, and you may recall that in the front room, um, one of the pieces, uh, uh, the one she's touching, your friend is touching actually, um, you had originally intended it to um, be the other way so that the, um, the top was, is now the bottom. And, you know, Javier, who's just re really relating to the work at, as, as a preparator at this moment before he's getting into the content, he's trying to execute on, you know, the artist's and the gallerist's uh, um, instruction. And so I guess it was on the floor in the, oriented this way. Um, and so he put it up on the wall that way. And I remember coming in and thinking first, oh no. And then second, like this makes so much sense to have one because you know since these are um, originally written um, on fragments or they are fragments at this point um, you know who's to say that the orientation would be that way versus another and maybe it also catches the viewer a little bit off guard gives them pause makes them slow down makes them consider well why um, and so I feel like from a curatorial perspective for me I really like I enjoy when those kinds of things happen and I always try to stay really open around that. It was great that it happened with this one too because um, there's a relationship 
in, in, the, in all of the reversals in the show, and I would say in my work in general, um, to grief or grieving. And mm. this, uh, this paper refers, that black border on the paper is a convention of 19th century stationery that, that would indicate that the letter writer is still in grieving. So if they've just lost uh, a person very close to them, that the black border is very thick. And then with time, it, it um, decreases incrementally. So if you see a very thin border, someone's almost out of mourning. Um, and so, so that was a have multiple way. boxes of stationery, um, you know, wider banded, narrower, 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 and then no border. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I should say that, um, that Dickinson's media or materials throughout her work is always stationary, even the fascicles um, or these folded folios that were intended for letter writing, the, um, all of the fragments are on paper media that was um, either around the house or used in correspondence. And it was the way that she sent out her work um, to recipients. She sent out 600 poems and letters. So um, I really think that um, highlighting, especially like with this piece, highlighting the um, correspondence part of it is makes a lot of sense. Then there was one piece that we hung upside down intentionally. Mm. Um, let's see if I can get to it. So over here, um, this manuscript says, I hope you have the power of hope. And again, it's like sloth, like the relationship of the writing to the whole piece of paper is really significant. She's only written in a small corner of it and then it's just open. Um, and then the other side is uh, hung upside down and it's uh, a continuation of that text. I hope you have the power of hope close. Um, and then it goes on about how um, grieving eclipses um, sense and the unconscious seals it. And so that was inverted for, for that side. Um, I wonder you know if it, that, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Katie. I was just gonna ask um, something that's been on my mind both with that piece and with the one that where it actually indicates that it's mourning stationary. Do you know that she was mourning somebody specific at that time? Um, I think it would have been stationary that came into the house that then mm -hmm. she repurposed. Um, but so not from like, it's not her, it would be a scrap of something, somebody else's paper essentially. Yeah, I think so. Um, because there aren't letter, well, it's hard to say actually, because we don't have a lot of, uh, we have the letters that are still within her archive, but we don't have all the letters she wrote, obviously. Um, but my guess is it's incoming. There are a lot of things that are on incoming media envelopes, letters and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I would guess that. But she lost so many people throughout her life. If you read her letters, like it just feels like every other day she's sending a note of condolence to someone. Um, so it's really um, a huge part of her experience, her life experience, but also um, it, it has a, a very large place in um, her writing, which also you know, has the gamut of a lot of humor too and strangeness and uh, so forth. So let's see if I can find another poem to read. Um, Jen, I was going to ask when you mentioned these works that are actually upside down in the space, um, that sort of raises for me something that looking at the images of a lot of these, I have a question about, which is legibility. Um, you know, you've, you've chosen this thread for these that kind of evokes graphite, but a, a, by so doing is quite difficult actually to read, especially when you're looking at it like we are like on a flat paint plane and unable to shift around it. Um, and I'm wondering how important it is for you that the text be legible um, and, you know, that, that you can read every word or, you know, perhaps the title close reading actually is designed to invite you to take as long as it would take you to figure out what every word is. But I, I wonder if you could speak to that in terms of the actual meaning of the poem versus its formal qualities, how important being able to read the words is. It's like the, the million dollar question. <laughs> That's really good. Um, I mean, I, I think it's so important to have an, ex, like a, an experience of the work um, yourself, you know, of trying to decipher what it is, of trying to read it. Um, 
and just taking your time and doing things in the order that you want to do them. So at the gallery, we have a, um, you know, a, a checklist of each piece with a transcription available. So um, for people who are very centered on reading, they can very quickly know what some, something says. If someone wants to experience it um, you know, more as a drawing, they can do that too. And, um, and the, the sort of issue of the silver and the batting kind of evening out, um, it, it, I think it's important that they're kind of in tension with each other um, in this body of work. And it also is a um, kind of a calibration that changes piece to piece. So like, um, like here, the silver is really legible um, or here too. It just depends on how thick the mark is. Um, this is a much thinner one, but like in the, um, the one that says it is very still. There we go. Sorry, it's way back here. Yeah. This one I sewed with a much darker, like a much steelier thread and a kind of a modeled thread. Um, because even though it looks in the gallery to be the same silver as the other works, it, you needed to, it's like, you know, color theory, you needed to calibrate the two in relation to each other. So this is actually a much darker silver um, than the others. And so it just, it, it was really literally piece by piece. And it was the same uh, with the dying that it was um, kind of each thing would teach me about its uh, nature. Um, but when it comes to reading Dickinson's script, I think um, it's something that you, um, of learn over time. And, uh, and so for me, it's usually pretty easy to understand what she's written, except for in the super redacted pieces. Um, but I like to experience it as a graphic event. I like to toggle between reading and looking. Um, and, you know, the other like sort of physical characteristics of the manuscripts, like this one has uh, like the fold here that joins the two. And um, so I try to I, I mean, ideally, I'd like to give anyone space to do it however they want to do it, but to make everything available, um, all the layers available that I can, so. It did become um, a, a brief conversation, um, to your point a little bit, Emily. Um, it, you may recall the slide that Jen showed of a fragment that then had a transcription of it. Um, and um, so I had wondered, you know, did it, should we have wall labels say um, that um, had the transcriptions on them? But I was hearing Jen say how important it was to her that like almost like this work of Dickinson's was calling to be understood visually as much as it is wanting to be understood in terms of reading the text. And so when she said she it was not her preference to have um, wall labels, it made sense to then have, a, you know, we have like a checklist for the show that has, um, you know, all the uh, little uh, translations of everything, um, transcriptions of everything below. Um, but it did come up last night when we were showing the exhibit to um, someone who visited the gallery who really wanted to read the text right away. She's a person who's very driven by language. So I think different people are gonna have different um, levels of patience for unpacking um, the visual. Like for some people, they're really comfortable just sitting in the space of not knowing exactly what it is that they're, they're looking at and experiencing it more formally say and then having the content reveal itself slowly. Um, but, uh, so, sorry. The, the um, thing I wanted to point to was the work that uh, I worked on with Marta Warner called Gorgeous Nothings, where 
we're working on these visual transcriptions of the reading space, but keeping the manuscript as the primary text. And so, you know, in the show and in this um, earlier book, I really wanted to foreground Dick, what, what Dickinson was doing and how she was doing it before a written transcription. Because if you scale the visual transcription of the text any larger than that, it, it becomes the dominant thing that you go to because it's easier to read. And so there's something that I really wanted to preserve both in kind of keeping Dickinson's scale um, consistent, but also keeping the transcription scale um, minor and consistent. Um, and so it was always a key into reading, but not a replacement for it. So this is a close up of what the transcriptions looked like in, uh, in that book. Um, but it's really tricky because even in the, the checklist, when you have a transcription of what you're seeing, it looks nothing like uh, what you're reading in person. So with Dickinson, there's this elasticity of space that's really um, kind of impossible to um, escape. <laughs> it's just one of the problems she presents to print, so. Um, something that um, strikes me so much as you talk about your work on sort of translating and um, transcribing these fragments and these manuscripts, um, is you know your dedication to the accuracy and sort of to the legacy of her not just her words but like her handwriting for example and the pieces of paper she wrote on and um, you know it's it's interesting I think because you also have worked um, in other bodies of work you've worked in relation to writing by male authors but um, from what I've seen you know for instance your work related to Shakespeare um, you're sort of using their language to create your own new meanings and your own new poetry in, in the case of Shakespeare. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to why it's important for when you're working with something like Emily Dickinson, who obviously is a, a woman writer, why the sort of um, authenticity to her word and her hand is maybe more important as it, as it strikes me, just knowing that sort of different part of your work. And if you could just sort of talk about your experience with her writing as a woman writer. Yeah, um, I think you had mentioned maybe in our correspondence that you think of, it, think of her as um, super canon canonical. Um, and while she is um, so much of what we understand to, um, about her work um, is really framed through the lens of gender. For example, um, that she is a, uh, considered to be a recluse, that she wore a white dress, that she mostly stayed in her bedroom, like these sort of uh, odd myths um, or pathologizing myths uh, were not just applicable to her work, they were applicable to any woman writing in a small town in New England in the 19th century. And they couldn't have all been reclusive and they couldn't have all not wanted to publish and they couldn't have all, you know, had these characteristics, but yet oddly in the intro introductions, they all do. Um, and so there's a very kind of, um, there's kind of a, uh, there's something that happens with women writers where um, the focus turns towards the biography and not towards the work. And I always want to push that needle back towards the work. Um, and I think that a lot of the reasons for pushing that needle have to do with gender. Um, and I mean, I think it's pretty crazy that, uh, you know, hundred over a hundred years after she died, we still don't have a reading edition that has her line breaks, for example. Um, and that's, that's a gender bias. That's because people think she didn't know what she was doing and that's super gendered. So there are a lot of things that, um, that I feel really passionately about that have to do with um, not honoring the intent of the work. Um, and it's, yeah, it's totally due to who's, who's editing and, and how they're approaching that. Um, so when I'm writing, for example, let me see if I can move forward quite a bit because I included some later works um, at the very end. 
So if I'm writing in relation to Shakespeare, and sometimes that work is called erasure, but I, I'm, Claudia was pushing me a little bit in our conversation to come up with another term, which um, I've been asked before, but I've, I feel like maybe entanglement is the closest um, term that I can think of to how I would um, frame that work. So work that is really um, beholden to and enmeshed in another writer's work, um, kind of the way a plant would talk to a bacteria, I being the bacteria. <laughs> um, and so like the way that I would relate to Shakespeare's work is a very different way that I would, than I would relate to say Su Wei's work. Um, Su Wei was a fourth century Chinese poet who wrote a poem with 8,000 possible readings in the form of a textile. And it was based on an astronomical gauge um, written in five colors, which correspond to a philosophical theory of elements and planets and colors and so forth. Um, and so because so little is known or unknowable about that poem, um, the way that I approached that work with my collaborator, Charlotte Lagarde, was to um, shift the perspective to contemporary Chinese women to discuss their view of the poem. And it was from a range of perspectives, calligraphers, um, astronomers, an astrophysicist, uh, um, uh, algorithmic game theorist, uh, talked about the coding and so forth. And so, and the, the piece is a five channel video installation. It's in um, Mandarin Chinese and in English and anything in the videos that are spoken in Mandarin will be transcribed in English on the screen and anything spoken in English will be transcribed in Mandarin. So it's a um, bilingual piece that way. And then it's the, I would say the other translation that happens is through the act of embroidery of watching um, a very uh, expert embroiderer in Sucho embroidering Su Wei's poem in real time. So you're looking at her embroidery from below the um, embroidery frame for like a span of seven hours in the gallery. So there's this um, fidelity to real time in the act of creating something that comes through that work. Um, yeah, a lot of my work takes a long time. <laughs> and uh, I think that the strategy, strategies by which I engage uh, other writers' work shift according to power relation, according to how known they are, how available the works are. Um, and so a lot of, yeah, a lot of things like with Su Wei are drawing attention to the work, but not just the work of Su Wei, but all of the issues around it, a lot of which are very feminist um, at their core, so. And with the projects like these, you know, you mentioned this new body of work, you worked with collaborators too, who were geographically spread apart from you. And then this, these projects under, you know, involve a lot of travel and research and things like this. I'm wondering if the uh, technique and the collaborators, et cetera, if you start there or if you start with the content and kind of, you know, sort of in a chicken and egg question of which grows first to inform the other. Um, you know, do you have an idea of a process you'd like to try or someone you'd like to work with and then you find something that brings you together or is it sort of the opposite starting with the language or the poetry or whatever it may be and finding other folks to bring in? Uh, I tend to trust things that stay with me a long time. So like the piece in the show that says emerging from an abyss and entering it again, that is life, is it not? That manuscript has been with me from the beginning. Um, and, and it was the first one that I made. And it was really just something that I needed to make. It wasn't, I didn't know that it would be the series. Um, and, and so it has a very different relationship to than something like Silk Poems, which was uh, spanned seven countries and 30 archives and took seven years. Um, all of this work is new and it's in the gallery after four months. So it's like, for me, super fast. Um, even though I've been, you know, I've read everything Dickinson wrote probably three times since 2004. So it's like fast and slow at the same time. Um, 
and um, collaborative in the studio, but not collaborative out in the world as much. Um, although it relies on a lot of other work by scholars like Marta Werner and Alex Zacharides and, and so forth. Um, yeah, I think it's more akin to works like River that were just uh, very long, slow processes of, of making. So River is a scale model of the Mississippi at one inch to one mile, and it's 230 feet long typically inscribed, uh, installed on the ceiling. And it took 12 years to make the uh, same amount of time sewing that would to walk the river. Um, so something like this is more um, just, you know, it overlaps with other projects more than close reading does. But I think now close reading will kind of <laughs> join the family of uh, things that take longer to make, so. Um, and I should also say that um, in the fall, I'm working on an artist book called The Sea for the Biennial in Montreal that will be a, a monster of a thing to make. It's another book within the writings of John Van Dyke. So poems that are written through sewing, um, through prose blocks. Um, this time with the first book that I did uh, with Van Dyke was in 2008 called The Desert. And this one is called The Sea and it'll be published next year, um, but exhibited this fall in proof form, so. Amazing, thank you for that teaser of what's coming sure. next. Um, and thank you so much. Um, we're at two o'clock, so I know if folks have other meetings or obligations, um, you know, just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. Um, and if anyone else has final questions, um, please feel free to share them now. Um, Jen, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add or, or Katie that we didn't get to yet. Um, Katie, I think you're muted. Uh, the only thing I would add is, um, is uh, if if you have a chance to see this exhibition in person, it's um, it, as you can tell, it's really tactile and um, really benefits from being experienced um, up close. Um, but also if you miss it, there will be a piece of gems in um, our summer exhibition, which is called Happening. Um, and um, so you have another, possibly another opportunity to see her work then too. Well, thank you so much, Emily and Jamie and Brindis, Kat, Katie and Anton. And, uh, no, thank you. It's been yeah, thank so you, exciting Jen. to hear you speak about this new body of work, and especially in relation to your past projects. Um, you know, could ask a million more questions, but um, can't wait to see it in person now that I am myself back in the Bay. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much. And thank you, Katie and Anton, for um, opening up the space to us this way. Um, yeah, I'll also plug that I, you know, I first came to Jen's work through her books. So if you can't get to the gallery, that's another really accessible way to consume some of her work is in your own personal library. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, um, thanks Anton for walking everybody through it. <laughs> um, and Jamie, thanks for the invitation to Jen too. I'm really glad that she got to share this show with all of you. So thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. And there's definitely some um, great comments in the chat too for everyone um, to read. So please join me in giving a little clap to Jen for sharing her wonderful work, um, to Katie and Anton in the gallery for working with us and for Emily for organizing um, all of this. We're really excited to be able to share this and we will have a recording posted in CCA archives um, probably by tomorrow. So if there's anyone you know who missed this and can't go to the show in person, we'll share it out that way. Thank you for that.